Hello, everyone. It is op- it's Eclipse Apocalypse here in Indiana, but today is April the 8th, and hopefully we will all survive the total eclipse of the sun. Hopefully. <laughs> Good morning, Christine and Wolfram. Thank you for doing all of the mod stuff that I appreciate greatly. Cynthia, retired firefighter, I hope you had a great weekend and you know, you're set up with your coffee, so that is good. Marlena Mars, good morning. And Melanie Dawson, I I totally feel you with the need to lose fluff, but I did get this shirt. Plump and unfiltered. And if, you know, we do lose our fluffiness, then we're just going to be unfiltered. <laughs> Good morning, Squab Bob and uh, Squid Pro Quo. Always good to see you. And I'm glad I I tried to get you a wrench, Squab Bob, and then I couldn't remember what your uh, little avatar looked like. So <laughs> I'm glad I got the right person. Always good, Squid Pro Quo. And we have some science to drop on you because, you know, we are all losing our mind here in North America about the eclipse. So can you make your own DE or DIY solar eclipse glasses? Probably, but let's see if we can. From the New York Times, a total eclipse will fly across North America on April 18th and it won't happen again for another 20 years, says NASA. You may not want to miss it, but staring at the sun for just a few seconds can blind you or cause lasting eye damage. The only time one can safely stare at an eclipse is when it's completely covered by the moon. Although even if most of the sun is covered by the moon and there's just a little bit of light peeking through, it's more than enough sun to damage your vision. So, class, what have we learned today? Do not stare at the sun even if there is an eclipse. You will burn your retinas. <laughs> Don't do that. Good morning, Erin, Olivia, and Audio Coffee. And hey, Joe and Slinky and Fisher of Men, always good to see all of you early in the morning. And be warned, unless it has a solar filter looking at the eclipse through a camera lens or binoculars. Now, why would you think about putting, never mind. I went to Walmart yesterday. People are losing their daggone minds. Do not... Um, use binoculars but i mean i can understand thinking camera lenses might help you but binoculars i mean unless you have a pair of binoculars for your neighborhood watch i mean your bird watching but still <laughs> uh quote viewing uh, without a special purpose solar filter secured over the front of the optics will instantly cause severe eye injury so NASA said on its website, oh dear Lord, these people are going to drive me nuts. Thank you, Shizzy, for a Shizzy raid. Awesome possum. Yeah, I we're just going to make a bunch of uh, boxes and we've got a bunch of glasses. It's supposed to be overcast here, so it's a total eclipse of the eclipse by the clouds, which People are charging like a hundred bucks for their driveway to drop, like park there. Why I didn't think about that, I have no idea. It's lucky there's a, luckily there's a way to view the eclipse safely, safely with a pair of special eclipse glasses. Though NASA says they don't approve of any particular brand of solar viewer, they warn people that normal sunglasses are not safe for eclipse viewing, no matter how dark they are. No, your officer -ness. they're tinted to 70%. They urge people to check their eclipse glasses or handheld viewers for scratches or tears or any side of damage. The American Astronomical Society pushed through a press release warning that people should be on the lookout for counterfeit glasses and provided a list of brands that meet safety requirements. Now there's always the pinhole projector that you can make. Everyone has a box lying around. If you order on Amazon as much as I do, you do. <laughs> and so, I mean, there are plenty of videos that can show you how to make a pinhole projector. 
And, you know, just the moral of the story, don't freaking look at the um, eclipse with just your regular eyeballs. It's just not going to work. <laughs> hey, you are all welcome. I have space. What I cannot offer is peace and quiet. Okay. <laughs> we have space. I can't offer quiet. I can't even allege quiet. <laughs> Someone else who's having, well, a no allegations of non-shenanigans. Apparently, Morgan Wallen is in trouble again, arrested on felony charges after allegedly throwing a chair from a sixth floor rooftop bar. I mean, look, if I if they were playing only Taylor Swift, I think I'd throw something, too. So I'm just saying or the new Beyonce thing. Oh, sir, do you not you? Our full Florida man in that mugshot. That's almost as good as Gary Busey on the day he just, hmm. Well, any day of Gary Busey, really. Country singer Morgan Wallen has been arrested and charged with three felony counts following an incident at a rooftop bar in Nashville, Tennessee. The Wasted on You hitmaker, 30 years old, was taken into custody after he allegedly threw a chair from the sixth floor of a chief's bar in downtown Nashville just after 1045 Sunday night, according to local media. Officers from the Nashville uh, Metro or Metropolitan Nas Nashville Police Department claim the chair landed three feet away from them. Why would you throw a chair right in front of the cops? Seems like, a, well, here's your sign, Bill Ingvall kind of thing. But, you know, you do you, sir. You have the mullet. I say go full Florida man. Show up with like some Ray-Bans, but old style Ray-Bans, a Paps Blue Ribbon and your pet, you know, swamp puppy and just say, I just, I, it's Florida man. <laughs> Cops arrested Wallen and booked him just after 1130 a.m. The cowgirl singer was, was charged with three counts of reckless endangerment and one count of disorderly conduct. Quote, at 10.53 p.m. Sunday evening, Morgan Wallen was arrested in downtown Nashville for reckless endangerment and disorderly conduct. His attorney, Warwick Robinson, told the Post in a statement he is fully cooperating with authorities. Know what you should yell is, you're not my supervisor. Full Charlene. We're going full Charlene from Archer or Cheryl. Wallen's bond was set at $15,250, and he was released from Davidson County Jail around 3.30 a.m. According to onlookers, the country star laughed after the ordeal. I know, what happened to, like, throwing a TV around, wrecking a Holiday Inn, and, and you know, setting a carpet on fire, which is why I was no longer allowed to listen to the um, New Kids on the Block, because... Whichever Wahlberg was involved with that totally made my mom Twitter pated. She's like, nope, they are bad influences. <laughs> An image posted on Instagram by at its uh, Coop Nashville appears to show Wallen shouting in the back of a cop car outside the bar. I worked there in the chair damn near took out two cops he threw it from the sixth floor one instagram worker who claims to work at the bar wrote in the comments section according to the davison county criminal court wallen's next court date is may 3rd the dates align with his upcoming performances in nashville well that's lucky he is slated to take the stage at Nissan stadium from may 2nd to may 3rd before hensing heading to pennsylvania as part of it his one night at a time tour. Maybe he meant one chair at a time. And those are fun chairs. How dare you, sir? Although, you know, even as someone who's totally into the maximalist, you know, decoration, this is kind of giving me anxiety. There's too much going on. I need one solid wall. <laughs> The Post has reached out to Wallen's reps and legal team for comment. This is not the first uh, run-in for the singer with law in Nashville. In May 2020, Wallen was arrested on intoxication and disorderly conduct charged as after being kicked out of Kid Rock's Honky Tonk Bar down in downtown Nashville. After the arrest, he took to X to uh, release 
his apology for his behavior. See, you had your hair cut, then you grew the mullet back, and it's just like the um, bad guy in The Simpsons is the hair. <laughs> hey, y'all, just wanted to clear the air. I went downtown last night with a few old friends. After a couple of bar stops, we were horse playing with each other, he wrote at the time. We didn't mean any harm, and we want to say sorry to any bar staff or anyone that was effective. Thank you to all the locals for being so professional and doing your jobs with class. He added in another tweet, love y'all. Wallen was previously charged with a DUI in 2016, but the case was dismissed. Wallen's last year, uh, Wallen last year released his third studio album, One Thing at a Time, which boasts 36 songs and hits like Last Night and Thinking About Me. Yeah, I've been deep diving into 90s music, so I have no idea what this guy sings, but he looks like my Allstate insurance guy without the mullet. So I guess, I guess you kind of need the mullet. The album follows the backlash Wallen faced in February 2021 after he was caught using the no-no word in an, a video recorded by his Nashville neighbors and obtained by TMZ. Dude, stop screwing up. You've got like the dream job for someone in music, which is people are paying you to play. And you have a mullet. I mean, honest to God, you should probably, you know, start going with a straight and narrow. Yeah, just stop doing dumb stuff. Someone get you into help. Look, it seems like you might could have a little problem with alcohol. Now, myself, I have a problem with eating after 8 p.m. So we can both work on taking smaller steps to make ourselves feel a little better and don't drink. Drink at home where you can throw your own damn chairs. If anyone has comic books laying around, a comic book featuring Superman's debut sells for a record-breaking $6 million. So if you have a copy of 1938's Action Comics number 1 featuring the first appearance of Superman, you know what? I'm just saying you kind of can start helping us with our buy that, you know, particular evil island so I can put my, you know, non-people in commune there. We have to, we have to sage the shit out of that island, but we're almost there. If anyone has one of these, a copy of a book inter that introduced, uh, Superman to the world became the world's most expensive comic book when it fetched $6 million at auction. Heritage Auction said a copy of Action Comics number one, the 1938 comic book featuring the first appearance of Superman, attracted a record breaking high bid of $6 million at Thursday's auction. The comic book featuring the iconic Man of Steel on its cover was inspected uh, by collectible grading service CGC and given a grade of very fine plus 8.5. Now, Hopefully you live in a house without smallish people, because if it were in my house for any limit of any time, if we had one of these, it would be dead meat. It'd be like very poor grade negative 84. <laughs> the CGC said only about 100 copies of the comics are believed to still exist as the service has only rated or graded 78 copies over the years. The comic was published by National Allied Publication, the predecessor to modern-day DC Comics. The previous record for the most expensive comic books was a copy of Superman No. 1 that sold privately for $5.3 million in 2022. The previous most expensive comic book sold at auction was a CGC Near Mint plus 9.6 copy of Amazing Fantasy No. 15, the first appearance of Spider-Man, which sold for $3.6 million in September 2021. Oh my gosh. I would love it. I love, I have seen advertisements for Rage Rooms. I have seen where you can like go in and take a bat and just destroy old things. I swear to goodness, every town needs one. I think we would stop a lot of... um <laughs> you know, fights and stuff. Everyone just needs a breaking thing room. Forget cry rooms, forget a safe space. We need sledgehammers and we need plates. We need lots of Corel plates. 
unbreakable plates. Hey, they survived in my house for almost eight years. Um, now I'm just gonna throw this out there for my for my chat, but apparently it is illegal to um just inject butt implants without a license. So for all of you who are confused, you have to have a license and possibly a medical degree to inject butt fillers. You know, we're shocked. Quote, right now it feels like marbles all over my butt. Mother and daughter busted for allegedly injecting butt implants without a medical license. Now, I think they mean fillers, but I don't know how one injects a butt implant. <laughs> A mother and daughter were arrested for allegedly trying to inject butt implants without having a medical license. Consuela de Bol, uh, Dalabo, 56, and her daughter, Isabella Dalabo, 18, were arrested March 28th. Consuelo is facing delivering a controlled substance, while Isabella is charged for practicing medicine without a license. You know, when I go into a house and they're like, hey, we've got some low price, you know, butt fillers. And they're like, oh, well, this is my 18-year-old daughter. She'll be working on you. You know, that's the time I'm going to turn around. <laughs> and go, you know what? Um, this Groupon coupon just doesn't seem doesn't seem worth it. But thank you. I don't want an 18 year old touching <laughs> anything on my body <laughs> as a doctorologist. According to the criminal complaint, the DeBoles showed up to a home in Houston with the intent of charging $6,000 to inject a person with butt implants. But the quote unquote customers were actually the Houston police and the Food and Drug Administration. The suspects were using bottles of an unlabeled brown liquid. This defendant was not even sure what was in the bottles, and this fundamentally demonstrates how remarkably dangerous these acts were. The complaint said the defendants do not have licenses to perform this kind of activity. This defendant provided a Xanax to the prospective customer, an undercover peace officer, for the purpose of relaxing her before the injections began. Yeah, here. Here's an extra Xanny bar that I have. Um, now... If you could just disrobe and let my 18-year-old daughter inject you with mystery liquid. I mean, this sounds like how most X-Men mutations start. Consuela de Bol has allegedly been doing this for years, and the results have not been pretty. ABC affiliate KTRK talked to four women who underwent the procedure, and they all had horror stories. All right, lovely women, I understand that you're all victims, but I need you to stand in front of the chat congregation and explain how you saw, you know, Consuela and 18-year-old daughter and thought, you know what, I'm going to continue with this endeavor. I am over here working my behind off to try to find a way to finance, you know, ketamine infusions for my actual disease that insurance doesn't cover. And these chicks are like, you know what? I'm going to get injections from this 18 year old and, you know, Consuela over here. Just no. Why? For the love of all the just flaming hot Cheetos. One of the women said that the elder Debolo showed her pictures of previous procedures on other women and said she previously worked on, quote, strippers and lawyers. What about the stripping lawyers? I feel like we are missing an entire genre of law tube now. The woman told the TV station she went to Consuela de Bolo's home, or Bo's home, where she was injected with the implants. She regretted it thereafter. Hmm. Can't imagine why. The side of my butt would get really red and sore to the touch. I'm pretty sure it was infected. Yeah, you probably gave yourself cellulitis and sepsis. For the love of all that is holy, said the woman who wished to remain anonymous. Right now, it feels like marbles all over my butt. Another woman told KTRK she's been suffering for 15 years. She reportedly got calf implants, but ever since she's had a constant battle with infections. Probably because they freaking injected you with Ebola. What? I feel bad for these women, but part of me is like, 
why? Why would you do this? I mean, I understand that not being comfy in the body that you have. Believe me, I everyone has things that are like, look, if I could just get X, Y, and Z done or Z, depending on where you are, you know, I'd feel much better about myself. But the problem is, is that you generally go to doctors or Brazil or Guam, you know, the place where maybe you didn't quite get into medical school, but hey, we do sort of have a medical apparatchiks that will help you. Not, you know, freaking Consuelo and her daughter Isabel with burst mid like mystery brown liquid that looks like it might be, you know, reused grease from an oven. I mean, seriously, I just need, I need someone to explain to me why you went through. Consuela de Bull sounded defiant in an interview with CBS affiliate KHOU before her court hearing Friday. Quote, believe me, everything I do, I do it with my heart because everyone who knows me, they know me, she told the TV station. I do it because they really need it, not just because they pay me. Well, um, I don't think anyone needed marbles in their butt or fake calf implants, but okay. She admitted to not having a medical license, but she said she went to medical school for three years in Mexico. But prosecutors aren't messing around. My biggest concern is for people who don't do their research before hiring someone like her or paying someone like her to put a chemical they don't know what's in, or that they don't know what's inside of them. Harris County Assistant District Attorney Sheila Hansel said both women are out on bond. I kind of feel like this is sort of a, I mean, it is a crime, don't get me wrong, but it does kind of seem like you go to someone's home, they pull out mystery liquid, their 18-year-old hands you, you know, their own prescription of anti-anxiety medications to help you with this. None of those are red flags. Like, if I walk into this new place that's supposed to help me with my pain and, you know, Consuelo and her 18-year-old daughter come out, I'm going to thank them and say, you know what, this is really good, but I will have to get back on to you before, you know, scheduling my first appointment. And then I just never call back. It does kind of seem like, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> For our sports ball fans, because you know I'm all about sports ball, first an earthquake, now an eclipse, Yankees to play ball on the same day as another supernatural phenomenon. So are the Yankees maybe causing a rift? Aren't they firing up CERN today too? You know, the particle collider? I'm just wondering if we'll get out of the dumb dumb timeline. Because I think that they fired up CERN somewhere around, oh, 2016-ish. And we diverged from the normal timeline. <laughs> and I, I am so glad that you all are stuck with me. But hopefully maybe this will just get us back on the, on the main, you know, not Marvel Earth 2020-17,000.4 timeline. That would be great. <laughs> A 4.8 magnitude earthquake shook New York City on Friday as the Yankees went through batting practice before their home opener. Three days later, the Yankees will play after another natural phenomenon, but at least this one is expected. No, no. What happened is New Jersey tried to get on the subway and someone pushed them in front of the car, so there was an earthquake. That's a pretty dark joke, but holy God. Even New Jersey is like, New York's going crazy. We're getting out of here, <laughs> even if it's a couple centimeters. A solar eclipse is forecasted to take place Monday afternoon. You know, I hadn't heard anything about it, so I'm glad that they told us. They are hosting the Marlins at 6.05 p.m., so we know where Sal is going to be. But holy God, it's it's a normal thing. It happens, you know, every 20-ish years. It hope you would think people are are stocking up at Walmart like it is a snow day. I mean, we were nearly out of bread at my store, milk, eggs. I was like, is everyone making French toast? And I didn't get an invite because 
you know, I love me a carb and French toast casserole is like the best thing since sliced bread. But if I didn't get any invitations and I made cinnamon rolls for my family this morning. So I should be getting some invites to this French toast thing. <laughs> Captain Kern, you're probably right. He He's trying to, you know, get in better shape. He... He really wants to be on TV a lot more. <laughs> uh, 10,000 miles and 352 days later, a UK man reaches his goal of running the length of Africa. Why? But okay. I mean, you know what? It's nice to have goals. Sore and sandblasted but triumphant, runner Russ Cook reached the northernmost point of Africa on Sunday, almost a year after he set off from its southern tip on a quest to run the length of the continent. Uh, dozens of supporters gathered on a rocky outcrop beside the Mediterranean uh, in northern Tunisia, cheering on the Brit British charity fundraiser who has run more than 10,000 miles across 16 countries. In 352 days. Okay, Forrest, point on a doll where your Jenny was from. Like, what in, what did Jenny do to you? Okay, why would you do this? I understand some people run for fun. I get it. I mean, in, intellectually, I get it. Cognitively, I don't. Uh, quote, I'm a little bit tired, Cook said, likely an understatement. In the course of his journey, the 27-year-old endurance athlete from Worthington or Worthing in South England crossed desert, jungle, and swerved conflict zones, was delayed by theft, injury, and visa problems. Cook, known on social media by his nickname, Hardest Geezer, said, what? Okay. <laughs> Set off on April 22nd, 2023 from Cape uh, Algas, Agus, in South Africa at the continent's southernmost point. He hoped to complete the journey in 240 days, running the equivalent of more than a marathon every day. He and his team had money, passports, and equipment stolen at gunpoint in Angola. Now, look, I'm... Try, not trying to be cynical, but you did pick like the the continent that has the most ongoing conflicts right at this moment. You didn't bring bodyguards and like strapped or get clapped, you know, big old guys that don't want to run, but maybe stopped and like rode on motorcycles. Holy God, you were going. I would have looked and said conflict zone, conflict zone, conflict zone. And I'd be like, hey, I know P. Diddy's out of action. Do you think any of his bodyguards would be willing to work for free? You know, it might look better on on their extracurriculars if they happen to go in front of testimony and have to maybe get in a little bit of trouble. But holy God. He was temporarily halted by back pain in Nigeria, and he was almost stopped in his track by the lack of visa to enter Algeria before diplomatic intervention from the Algerian embassy in Britain managed to secure the required documents. Cook, who has spoken about running, um, how running helped him deal with his own mental health struggles, previously ran about 2,000 miles from Istanbul to Worthing in 68 days. His Africa run has raised more than eight hundred seventy thousand for running the running charity, which works with homeless people, young people. That's good. I mean, I, look, as much as I make fun of him, he's doing this for a cause, and he's raising money for homeless young people, and Sandblast, a charity that helps displaced people from the Western Sahara. It's quite hard to put into words. 352 days on the road is a long time without seeing family and my girlfriend, Cook told Sky News as he started running Sunday, accompanied by his supporters who'd come far and wide to run the final stretch with him. My body is in a lot of pain, but one more day, I'm not going to complain. Cook said he planned to celebrate with a party where British band Soft Play was due to perform. We're going to have strawberry daiquiris on the beach tonight, he said. It's going to be unreal. Well, I'm glad he got to have strawberry daiquiris, which, you know, are the best of the, you know, girly frozen drinks that you can have. 
I mean, it's not sex on the beach, but what are you going to do? So I am, I am happy for him that it's helped his mental health. Uh, running probably would not help my mental health, but you know, someone's got to do it. And kind of not sure this is a crime right now, but I feel like I might have become a terrible person after starting watching all the news. But I'm kind of like, why are we charging this man? <laughs> and I think you guys will see why. Man pleads guilty to help ki to helping kidnap and unalive uh, Arkansas resident who was accused of assaulting a young girl. I mean, I feel like, okay, and acquitted. This is why you don't want me on the jury. <laughs> a man has pled guilty to helping kidnap and unalive an Arkansas resident who was accused of raping a young child. According to court documents filed on Friday, Reginald Loray Baker... LaRue Baker, 43, was sentenced to 60 years in prison on each count of accomplice to murder in the first degree, accomplice to kidnapping, accomplice to aggravated residential burglary. He received 861 days time served. Authorities have said that he and his co-defendant, Daniel Paul Bitt, Blings, 45, or at a birthday party with Richard Phillips, as well as a teenage girl on October 27, 2021. The girl told Baker and Blanks that Phillips had raped her when she was six years old, according to investigators. Baker, who used to date Phillips' wife, allegedly became enraged and reportedly grabbed a, well, a force multiplier from the kitchen, you know, butcher block. And said that he was going to unalive the alleged uh, assaulter. The tree who, or the tree, the girl who was still a juvenile reportedly told investigators she was able to calm Baker down and got him to promise he would not physically harm Phillips. But the Springfield Police Department said they received a call on the night of November 23rd, 2021. The two men broke into Phillips' apartment and brutally attacked him, his friends told authorities. While, um, Getting him to unconsciousness, the two accused Phillips of assaulting the little girl in the past, authorities said. The suspects dragged Phillips' body down the third floor apartment into a vehicle, according to officials. Responding officers discovered a trail of blood leaping out of the front door to a spot where the friends said the suspects parked their car. Phillips I am not dressed up as Courtney Clenny today. I just had a really bad hair day and we have a somewhat um, important financial meeting. So, you know, I wanted to look professional, but still me because plump and unfiltered. If you love t-shirts, um, Piper Lou. I'll put the link in the description after I'm done, but they have wonderful t-shirts, good quality, but I am not dressed up as Courtney Clenny. I am just dressed up as a person who's not a hot mess most times. <laughs> Philip's body was discovered on November 27th, 2021 by a group of hunters in a heavily wooded area of Mark Twain National Forest in Missouri. Phillips reportedly had been stripped to being unclothed, he was severely beaten, and um, he had a couple freedom seeds in his body from a force multiplier, if you understand what I'm saying. His body was also reportedly mutilated, so I'm guessing they removed his um, bait and tackle, if you will. That's just my guess. That is hot speculation. So take that with like 900 pounds of salt. Investigators obtained the girl's phone, which reportedly held text messages between her and Baker. Police said that after Phillips went missing, the girl texted Baker to ask if he had anything to do with it, and he replied he did not. Authorities, however, said they matched Blank's truck to the one that the suspects used, and it had blood on its bed. Police found Baker, or Baker and Blank's sitting in Baker's truck on the property and took them into custody without incident. 
they said. The men believed or were set to be tried in Arkansas because that's where the authorities believed the murder happened. Blanks is scheduled for a status hearing to take place September 20th. So here's my issue with this, and this is my soapbox, is if Child Protective Services, if you know, parents are not going to take care of things, you are going to see more and more of this. We have a lot of pushes. It's not a conspiracy to, you know, lower ages of consent to, you know, make minor attracted people, you know, part of the umbrella of the LGBTQ, ARP, STOTX, you know, community. This is not something that is a conspiracy. As a parent, I see this. I see people that are trying to lower the age of consent or say age is just a number. This scares me because in no way, male or female, as a youngling, as a 13-year-old, as a 12-year-old, are you in any way ready for a relationship or can consent to, you know, being abused? I'm sorry, Mary Kay Letourneau, that was abuse. I watched her documentary and oh my Lord, this woman is off, just off. She's like, well, he was the aggressor. He came after me. I'm like, ma'am, he was 13 and he was, you know, talking to you on a dare. What the heck is wrong with you? So that's my little soapbox is if you don't want parents or people to go a little, you know, night wing, night vigilante, you better start taking care of these people. You better start seeing this as a crime. You better stop giving these crazy teachers slap on the wrist because they're females and they abused males. That's my soapbox and I'm going to get off now, but it makes me a whole lot big mad that these female teachers are not getting big things. And then people wonder why a lot of people are turning to vigilante justice. I mean, this is the same sort of circumstances that you had when movies like Dirty Harry and Death Wish came out because the general zeitgeist was more in favor of the criminal and people were getting fed up. People are getting fed up with this bail, you know, cashless bail stuff with these, you know, criminals getting out all the time. And think of, think of the criminal. Won't somebody please think of the hard life of the criminal? We used to think of the victims. We used to think, goodness, this person has done aggravated assault. Maybe we should keep them out of the general population because they don't seem to be able to control their hands and feet. But no, now it's like, for the love of all this holy, have we thought about his past? Have we, have we, you know, thought maybe he's just too, too sad or something? No, start thinking about the victim. And Flash Fan, I am doing fine today. I hope you're doing well. I apparently slept through two alarms. So I woke up at 7.30. Like, you know that hysterical wake up where you somewhat levitate out of your bed because you realize how late you slept in? <laughs> so I did that flying leap out of bed and then realized I am not coordinated enough to do a flying leap. <laughs> Um, in what the Schnell is going on with container ships, a massive container ship loses power near NYC's uh, Vera Verrazano Bridge days after the Baltimore Key Bridge disaster. Where is my tinfoil hat? I need my tinfoil hat. Where has everything gone? All right. This is my tinfoil hat for some reason. Yep. All right. For today only. Tinfoil hat time. A massive container ship lost uh, propulsion power in the waters around New York City and was brought to rest near a Verrazano Narrows Bridge Friday night, less than two weeks after a failure on another massive cargo vessel used or caused it to smash into Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge. The U.S. Coast Guard confirmed that its vessel traffic service received a report that an 89,000-ton MVAPL Quindano, Chindano, 
look, Quindingo, Queen Dio. Duct tape and holy water takes no responsibility for the fact that our host graduated before no child left behind and therefore cannot read. Names and such. Lost propulsion around 8.30 p.m. as it traversed the Kilven Cull. The shipping lane between Staten Island and Bayonne, New Jersey. An image shared on X by John Conrad, CEO of maritime-focused news outlet G-Captain, shows the 1,100-foot APL boat floating uncomfortably close to the span that connects Brooklyn and Staten Island. In response to the power failure, three tugboats were that escorted APL uh, escorted the boat, guided the vessel until it regained propulsion a short time later. The vessel was brought into position just north of the bridge where it anchored. Uh, quote, U.S. Coast Guard Vessel Traffic Service New York received a report from the M-V APL uh, Quindillo around 8.30 fr p.m. Friday night. That vessel had experienced a loss of propulsion in the Kilven Cole waterway, the vessel regained propulsion and was assisted to safely anchor in Stap Stapleton Anchorage outside the navigatable channel just north of the Verrazano Bridge by three towing vessels, the Coast Guard said. These towing vessels were escorting the vessel as a routine safety measure, measure which is common practice for large vessels departing their berth. Uh, the Kill Van Cull is a narrow three wide or three mile long tidal strait separating Newark Bay, the home to Port Newark Container Terminal in Upper New York Bay. It is one of the ports of New York and New Jersey's busiest waterways. The U.S. or the Coast Guard required the vessel's propulsion system to be certified that it had been repaired and was fully operational. Well, glad someone's checking. The crew was also required to provide a detailed casualty report documenting precisely what contributed to the loss of propulsion. After meeting those requirements, the vessel was allowed to resume its voyage to Charleston, South Carolina, where I'm sure it will stop dangerously close to another bridge. Despite the unsettling optical illusion, the image brings to mind last month's deadly Francis Scott Key Bridge disaster in Baltimore in which six construction workers were killed when the cargo ship Dolly rammed one of the 1.9 mile bridges support, sending the structure tumbling into the, oh, into the river. I don't know how you say that. The Patapsico River. The collapse ground maritime transit to a halt in the vital port of Baltimore, speaking on CBS's, quote, Face, or Face the Nation Sunday morning, Maryland Gover Wes, Governor Wes Moore said it was, quote, realistic to expect that normal operations would resume on the waterway as early as May. It's an aggressive timeline, but we're going to work around the clock to make sure we hit this timeline, Moore said. The Dolly appeared to suffer a loss of powering leading up or loss of power leading up to the Baltimore crash. The APL other boat, by contrast, just lost propulsion. Well, I'm glad that we're making sure that all of these big, giant, huge, enormous boats are fully operational. It's almost like the airlines. You're taking away my ability to feel safe in the air and now at the sea. <laughs> The boat is registered in Malta and owned by a French shipping and logistics company, CMACGM, that was bound for Norfolk, Virginia by the at the time it lost power. CMACGM could not be reached Sunday. Conrad did not report or respond to messages from the post seeking comment. Yeah, well, there you go. You know... Someday we'll figure out how to get, you know, things mechanically to work. I don't know if it'll be today, but in sad news, firehouse frontman C.J. Snare, dead at 64, were all in complete shock. 
CJ Snare, the lead singer of 80s hair metal band Firehouse, behind hits like Don't Treat Me Bad and Love of a Lifetime, died unexpectedly on Friday he was 64. The band more mourned Snare's passing as a, quote, sad day for rock and roll, end quote, in a statement on Facebook Sunday. See, look at what y'all had for teen idols, and we get, we get young slug life. <laughs> as you are all aware, CJ was expected to be back on stage with the band this summer after recovering from surgery. <coughs> Excuse me. A statement read adding everyone in the group was in complete shock with CJ's untimely passing. CJ was arguably one of the best vocal talents of a generation touring the world with Firehouse nonstop for the past 34 years, the statement said. Our heartfelt condolences go to the entire Snare family, Catherine Little, friends, and all of our beloved friends or fans, I'm sorry, all over the world. Reach for the Sky, CJ, the Post concluded, referring to their 1992 song of the same name. You will be forever missed by family, friends, fans, and your bandmates. You're singing with angels now. Several fans of the group also shared their shock over Snare's sudden passing. A living legend, love your music, so glad to have worked with you and met you, one person commented on the Facebook post. Your music and voice is my inspiration. My condolences and respect to the family. Rest well, my friend. Your voice inspired generations. This is so sad. CJ was one of the most kind-hearted, beautiful people I ever met. He was like family, a huge loss to the world, wrote a second person. No words. This is terrible. My heart goes out to his loved ones. His, he was a friend and a true talent. The thir a third person lamented. And the reps for Snare did not contact the Post by the time this was done. So, unfortunately, we lost another rock legend. And that's really, really sad. And good morning, Fraud Wrangler and Jess Ruby and Captain Kern. And I think I said hi to you, Audio Coffee. But if I didn't, no. Good morning. And Bearded Man Steve. So, it's sad. I didn't realize that... Those songs were from Firehouse, but now I think I might just have to delve into a Firehouse kind of day. And why and why? Wyoming Hunter sparks outrage for allegedly wounding Wolf, then parading it in a bar before unaliving it. Now, I understand that there's going to be people on both sides of this. There are the ranchers that have to live with, you know, the fact that their livestock might be attacked by reintroduction of wolves. And there are people that really want the natural biome of, you know, places that used to have wolves to have that apex predator come back. So I really can see both sides of this. What I can see is if, if you have to take the life of a predator to stop your animals from being attacked. It's not a joyous thing. It's not a thing that you should be doing this kind of crap with. Look, I think this dude is gross. That's my personal opinion. But again, if you have to take the life of another animal because you have to you have to deal with the real life consequences of your herd being attacked i can understand that this parading an animal around is gross i believe it is but i believe there has been major pushback the the problem is is that you have the people that would like to reintroduce the wolves to the natural habitat generally live in the city and don't have to deal with the consequences of you know, herd loss, you know, livestock injuries, and definitely, you know, maybe even dog attacks because people generally do have, you know, like shepherd dogs or things like that. So unfortunately, it, it definitely is a, a rural versus city thing. But it it definitely it comes from two different mindsets people that want things to happen but don't have to real deal with the reality of the consequences of these actions 
a Wyoming hunter has sparked outrage with me after allegedly capturing a wolf, taking taping its mouth shut and tormenting it by parading it in a bar before finally unaliving it. What, sir, you are a dingleberry. You are that irritating little dingleberry that gets caught in the behind hole of, of humanity. You are so gross. Sorry. <laughs> just sorry. But this just takes me off, especially after Fry, because that looks like a terrified animal, a terrified Fry Bert that just wants to get out. And it really ticks me off. Cody Roberts, 42, of Daniel, has been cited for a wildlife violation over the sickening instant incident on February 29th, the Cowboy State reported. A shocking photo obtained by news outlets shows the wolf with red tape wound tightly around its muzzle as Robert poses with the animal in his home. You absolute jackass. He allegedly disabled the wolf when he ran over it with a snowmobile, but instead of taking it and putting it out of pain if he did hit it with a snowmobile because he's a you know what I'm going to go ahead and say it. he's a twat waffle he is a he's a twatopotamus he is a butt monkey which is legal in the part of Sublet County where the incident happened he took the animal to his home and then to the bar Roberts finally took the wounded animal out behind the bar and ended its suffering, according to Cowboy State Daily. This is so gross, just so gross. This is awful, said Robert Wallace, who oversaw U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service as Assistant Secretary for the Interior in the Trump administration. Wyoming represents the best wildlife stewardship, and this is sad and disgusting outlier he told the outlet i or in no way do i believe this represents who we are as a state wyoming fish and game spokesperson brianna ball told cowboy state daily that an anonymous tip was received march 1st quote the individual was hunting when he came across the wolf in a predator zone and intended to harvest it however the wolf was transported alive back to his residence and later to a business in Daniel, Wyoming, she said in a statement. The individual euthanized the wolf later that day. It, the individual was cited for violating Chapter 10, Importation and Possession of Lived, Warm-Blooded Wildlife, Ball added. Roberts was fined $250. No, what he needs is just a line of people just allegedly in Minecraft biffing him on the back of the head while he's duct taped with his mouth shut. Now, allegedly, and I'm a little fired up about this because I'm sorry, but I just see a terrified, terrified Frybert in that dog bird, doggo's eyes. And it's, look, it should be a very sad and, you know, not a joyous, but a a reverent thing, if you do have to unalive an animal because you ran into it, I mean, I would be bawling my eyes out and I'd probably have to call Mr. Mo to take care of said poor, you know, broken animal. But would I ever take it to a bar? Would I ever prolong its suffering? Absolutely not. I mean, just beyond gross. And he only got 25 or $250 of a fine, a penalty, game, and fish said it's the only penalty it has the power to enforce. The callous mistreatment of the wolf is not illegal under this under state law, according to the outlet. People may be charged with cruelty to animals, but that only applies to pets and domestic animals, not predators like wolves. Y'all, I... I'm glad I would not, I was not in that bar because the amount of, <laughs> of just general effery that would have come out of my mouth, like the, the string of curses that would, I would take 
Wolf Friberto out of that bar and I would give him all the hugs and then I'd take him to a vet and I'd have to sit with him and watch him pass away again. And I'd be so pissed off. This guy is such a douche nozzle. And I look, sir, what goes around comes around. I'm just saying that allegedly in Minecraft and someone is right. That is a one way ticket to Snake Island. Look, I don't care what your politics are about the wolves coming back, but you don't do that to an injured animal. To make us all feel better, though, the doggos fought back in this one. <laughs> oh my gosh, I saw this. But a hundred huskies escape dog cafe and run through a Chinese mall. Possibly also not safe doggos. Go back to the safe cafe. Yes. Well, I'm glad I'd have a bunch of people at my back. I wouldn't be the only loud redhead saying, the hell is going on here? The dogs had their day at a Chinese mall when a hundred huskies escaped from a pet cafe and ran loose through the shopping center. Uh, my guess is huskies, Friberto being part husky, part we have no idea, they probably listened about 0% when they were told, like, get back in here. Come on. Come on. <laughs> they were like, no, we're having fun. I'm going to Cinnabon. Workers at the cafe in Shenzhen, Guangdong, said someone left the door open, allowing the hundreds, the hundred canines to run out into the shopping mall, surprising and delighting shoppers. Oh my gosh, y'all, I would so go to the mall if there were just hundreds of huskies just wandering around looking for pets and snuggles. I am not a peopling person. I told this to my very first and very new therapist. And I said, look, as long as we don't have to do immersion therapy where I become a Walmart greeter, I am willing to try therapy, but I refuse to, to people. <laughs> Cafe employees said the dogs were excited because the business owner was visiting the cafe after a prolonged absence. Workers ran out after the dogs and were able to round up the excited animal after animals after a prolonged indoor chase. The closest things I've ever gotten to this is when I was introduced to about a dozen chihuahua puppies. Oh my goodness, the cutest stampede ever! I think they had a hundred because I'm guessing if it's a pet cafe, you have extra animals so they don't get overstimulated. They don't get too many pets. So you can rotate them around. I don't know why you would have a hundred dogs in a cafe in China. I'm trying to make sense. <laughs> they were just like, rum, rum, rum. Fry used to do that. And I call him, I would say he was cursing because he would go, rum, rum, rum. And I'd be like, don't you curse at me, sir. I told you we were not going outside. <laughs> so I hope those huskies had the time of their lives, got a couple of little pets before they got in, well, put back in the cafe. <laughs> Our final story, if you were up in Vermont, Senator Bernie Sanders needs your help. Well, apparently not because they've arrested this guy. But a suspect was arrested for allegedly trying to arsonate uh, Senator Bernie Sanders' Vermont office, the feds say. The man who allegedly set fire to the door um, of Bernie Sanders' office in Burlington, Vermont, has been arrested, according to U.S. Attorney's Office. Authorities took uh, Shantai Sogahoman, also known as Michael Saga Homian. What he's just pissed off about his last name. I'm gonna be honest with you. If I, as a spelling and grammar outlaw, had to try to deal with that as a child, I still probably wouldn't know how to read. 35 into custody on Sunday. He's accused of using an accelerant on the door of Sanders' office on Friday morning, setting it ablaze and running away. The whole incident was captured on surveillance video, officials say. Burlington Police Department said, quote, a significant fire engulfed the door and part of the vestibule, trapping several Sanders staffers inside. Now, look, 
I don't care how you are politically, but you do not, do not arsenate things so people cannot get out. That is my worst nightmare. But sir, first of all, it's called voting. If you don't like him, vote him out. Don't fire him out for the love of all that is holy. Also, we have CCTVs everywhere. Everyone has a ring doorbell. I mean, unless you had one of those invisibility shields, I would not do a crime. I would not do a crime. Let's just stop. The Burlington Police Department, oh, okay, the sprinkler system turned on, which largely put out the fire. First responders evacuated the senator staffers, as well as workers in surrounding offices. The door and vestibule received moderate damage, and there was significant water damage to the area and the floors below Sanders' office, cops said. Burlington police released a photo of the suspect on Friday, and officials had him arrested less than 48 hours later. Well, Vermont police. Maybe you can talk to Wisconsin police using evidence to connect a theory to a person. It's wild. I'm sure you'll hear about it. It's called police investigation. No worries. Burlington police released a photo. Oh, sorry. The motive for the fire has not been released. Sanders was in California speaking to striking hotel workers on Friday. If convicted, the... Uh, Accused faces between five and 20 years in prison, along with a fine of up to $25,000, no, $250,000. So wait, let me get this straight, because I'm just mathing and, and trying to get, I mean, I'm naturally blonde under the fake red, but let me just make this perfectly clear. Okay. Hurt a, a majestic creature, bandy it around a bar for other stupid yokels, and then unalive it after it's been in pain all day and you taped its muzzle shut, $250. Start a fire for Bernie Sanders' office, $250,000. I mean, I understand people were stuck, so I get that, but still a bit hot mad about that wolf one. And if I ever met that dude in public, allegedly there would be some strong words because you don't hurt a feral Fry Berto. Not on my watch. No, sir, you do not. We are grateful to the Burlington Fire and Police Department who responded immediately today to a fire incident that took place in our office building. Catherine Van Haste, the Vermont State Director for Bernie Sanders, said in a statement to the New York Times, Burlington Mayor Emma Mulvaney, or Mulvaney Stanick said in a statement to CNN, she thanked law enforcement for bringing a swift revolution to a resolution, not revolution. That's what he wants um, to the investigation. Quote, my offer this has offered to support the support of Burlington Community Justice Center for Senator St Sanders staff. And we will continue to be in closed communication with their offices I mean, couldn't he just open up his third home that he bought after writing a book about billionaires and millionaires? I mean, couldn't he just, you know, use one of his third homes? I'm just asking for a friend. I mean, really, does the does the state need to contribute any more to this dingus? Any hoozle. I hope you all have a wonderful and safe day today. If you are in the path of the eclipse, please. Please do not look directly into the sun with your eyeballs or your iPhone. Always use, a glasses or use the glasses or make the little pinhole thing. Now, I am sending you all off to the lawyer you know. I think he is covering... I'm sorry, my mind is blinking. I've got six kids trying to do e-learning. <laughs> but he's covering something, and I am trying to diversify where I send you guys um, just to kind of diversify. Honest to goodness, y'all, I swear to goodness. So it doesn't bother me to wear wigs and be deeply silly on the internet, but sending people to new creators that I haven't really ever talked to, I have to kind of psych myself up. But 
that's what I'm trying to do. So have a wonderful day and I will see you tonight and hopefully we all survive. And if you didn't see Twitter, let me put this on or X or whatever we're calling it now. I got these. These were at my local Walmart and I'm, I'm suddenly realizing that, um, Nicholas had an idea. The hot, the hot sauce idea was pretty good for the Wheel of Regrets. Why I got these for my Wheel of Regrets? Because I will regret this. So have a wonderful day and I will see you all later. Bye guys.